morning, Mesa. Today's scripture will be coming from Joshua chapter 7 and verses 1 through 9. That's Joshua 7, verses 1 through 9. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth-Avon, to the east of Bethel, and told them, Go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied out Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, Not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or three thousand men to take it, and do not weary the whole army, for only a few people live there. So about three thousand went up, and when they were routed, they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about thirty-six of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, At last, sovereign Lord, why do you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say now that Israel has routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this. They will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for your own great name? Let the church say amen. Amen. Can you hear me now? All right. Let me see all the red Bibles. Hold up the red Bibles. Where are your red Bibles at? Red, R-E-A-D. R-E-A-D. Any form will do. We can do paper, electronic, um, maybe in the heart. (laughs) All right. Open up your red Bible to Joshua chapter 7. And I want to invite you to the subject this morning, stay out of trouble. Stay out of trouble. Since being here at the Mesa Church, It has been absolutely amazing. What a blessing you are to myself and my family. I just want to take this time to thank all of you for your thoughtfulness, um, for your cards, for your support, for your encouragement. Uh, Special thanks to Amanda. uh, I think it's Mariano. She's not here right now. They're in Disney World, I think, or Disneyland. Uh, but she was our realtor. We closed on our house just this past uh, Wednesday. So things are awesome. Uh, special thanks to Jimmy Garcia, who was here in the audience and helping that process to go smoothly. Another special thank you to Jackie Hinkle um, for all the things that he's done in helping the transition. And a special thanks to all of you. Thank you so much. We are excited to be here and to finally get a chance to get settled in. So just keep us in your prayers as we make this transition. Stay out of trouble. Being here at the Mesa Church, I have identified some members here who are troublemakers. (laughs) I won't say any names, Wayne. (laughs) Gotta love Brother Wayne. So hopefully the lesson this morning will uh, encourage us uh, in... Uh, Give us information on what it is that we need to do to stay out of trouble. And I want our main text to come from Joshua chapter 7. I know many of us here are familiar with the story of of Joshua, the battle of Jericho. And you can read about that in Joshua chapter 6, where Joshua is a successor of Moses. Moses has died. Joshua is now the, the leading military commander of the children of Israel. And here he is going to 
conquer Jericho. And we all know the story, how the Lord had told Joshua to uh, circle around the city for six days uh, with the priests and the trumpets and the Ark of the Covenant. And he says, on the seventh day, you will encamp around the city seven times. Uh, and on the seventh time, you will give this, this great shout and the walls will come what? Tumbling down. Tumbling down. And when you take the city, God gave them some very strict, explicit commandments. He said, when you go into this city, I want you to destroy absolutely everything. The women, the men, the children, the livestock. And all of the spoils of that city, I need you to devote them to me. They belong to me, thus saith the Lord. And then when we get to Joshua chapter 7, Joshua is, is, is on the mountaintop. They've just conquered Jericho. And so he sees the next city in view, Ai, or some may refer, uh, prefer to call it I. But let's just say Ai is in view. And Joshua says, let's, let's go and take that city too. His ambition, his confidence in himself and in his army, not knowing the situation of his army, led them to be destroyed by the city of Ai. Where Joshua said, you know what? We won't send the entire army of Israel We'll send two or 3,000. Ai is such a small little town. It would be easy for us to take this city. Let's just send a few troops. And then Ai destroyed 36 men of the children of Israel and caused them to flee, to run in despair. The Bible says that their hearts melted in fear of this small little town called Ai. Come to find out, it was due to the sin of one man by the name of Achan, where he took those devoted things from Jericho where God commanded him not to, and he took them for himself, and because of his sin, the entire nation suffered defeat. So here our story begins. Joshua Chapter 7. So as I've, I've read this story many of times, it is so rich and full of information. And as I think about Achan, I could only ask the question, Achan, how could you? I mean, how could you do this, this outrageous sin against God and the children of Israel, knowing God's commandments? And I had to ask myself, would I do the same thing if I was in Achan's shoes? And I hope the answer is no. But when I sit back and truly think about Achan, I find out that Achan is very relatable to us today. For instance, Achan was a believer in God. Do we have any believers in God in the audience today? Raise your hand. All right. He's relatable in that area. Achan had a family and was a part of a family. Are there is there anyone in here who has a family? Raise your hand. All right, amen. He's relatable in that area. He was deeply connected to a larger spiritual family. How many of us are connected to a larger spiritual family? Raise your hand. Amen. We're on, we're on point here. Achan had a faith that was active. I mean, he was a soldier in God's army fighting, carrying out God's judgment against sin. His faith was active. How many of you have an active faith? Raise your hand. Amen. But Achan also sinned. Can we be honest with ourselves this morning? Raise your hand if you sometimes sin. Amen. So Achan isn't far removed from us at all, is he not? Hopefully you can see yourself in Achan. Achan looks a lot like us. 
So this morning, I want to give you five realizations to stay out of trouble. Five realizations to stay out of trouble. Realization number one is realize that sin is serious. Realization number two, realize that sin is no secret. Realization number three, realize sin is self-centeredness. Realization number four, realize that sin is a sequence. And number five, realize sin is solvable. So let's contemplate just for a moment. It is easier to stay out of trouble than it is to get out of trouble. So we're all going to resolve this morning to stay out of trouble. Realization number one, sin is serious. Sin is serious. Joshua chapter 7, verses 4 and 5. It shows us that sin hinders the success of the assembly. And it reads, So about 3,000 men went up from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. That word melted comes from the Hebrew word masas, means to melt away, to vanish, to completely dissolve, to become fearful and lose confidence. So as a result of this battle, this military force was now less confident in themselves and also in God. They went from being a, a, a powerhouse, a military powerhouse, having God fighting their battles. And here they are with no confidence, full of depression. Church, this tells me that one believer's sin can negatively impact an entire group of believers. If you look back in Joshua chapter 7, verse 1, it says the Israelites, however, were unfaithful regarding the things set apart for destruction. I find that very interesting because the Bible tells us it is Achan who sinned against God. But here God says the children of Israel, the collective body, was unfaithful regarding the things set apart for destruction. The entire nation was held guilty because of one man's sin. I want you to think about this for a second. Achan would be similar to what a church member is today. Right? <clears throat> Joshua would be similar to what a preacher or an elder is today. How often times do we set these high expectations for those leading the congregation? Maybe it's the preacher, the youth minister, the family minister, the elders, the deacons. A lot of times we put these high expectations and we expect moral excellence out of people leading the assembly of God. But we hold the parishioners the people in front of you, the people behind you and next to you, oftentimes we hold them at a much lower standard of behavior. Do we not? So we need to be very careful when we think to ourselves that, oh, the preacher, he better not sin against God. The elders, they, they better not sin against God. But what about the church members? I think that we all are held to the same level of expectations when it comes to God's commandments. Amen? Amen. So we see that God withheld his, his blessings from the entire assembly because of the sin of Achan. Not only that, sin also hinders the presence of God. Look at verse 12. 
Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have devoted, because they have become devoted for destruction. God says, I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Now, this is very significant for the children of Israel, where God withdraws his presence from them due to sin. Why is that important? Think about what God's presence meant to the children of Israel. His presence meant protection. His presence meant food. Remember the manna, the quail, the water from the rock, all came from God. His presence meant uh, all types of provisions. The Bible says that the children of Israel, as they were wandering in the wilderness, they had these sandals that would never deteriorate because of God's presence. God's presence meant foreknowledge, where God provided them with prophets, able to give them a glimpse into the future of what to expect as a result of their choices Can you see how significant God's uh, presence is with the children of Israel? His presence meant meant wisdom. It meant scientific foreknowledge. If you are unfamiliar with that term, do some some study on the water of purification. And you'll see how God knew so much more about antibiotics before we ever did. Amen. Amen. God's presence meant mercy, grace, love, forgiveness for the children of Israel. So what does this tell us about God and his relationship to sin? It tells me that God cannot fellowship with sin. It is against his moral perfection. Continuing to bless Israel as they sinned against him would imply that God condones sin. So because of his moral excellence, he had to withdraw his presence from the children of Israel. So church, we must resolve in our, in our hearts today that we would rather have the presence of God as opposed to the presence of sin. Amen? Sin also hinders the victory over our enemies. Look at verse 13. Here Joshua comes to God. And he's saying, God, you know, why in the world would you allow us to be destroyed? And he says, it would be better if we stayed on the other side of the Jordan River. Why did you bring us here to be humiliated? And then God tells tells Joshua in, in verse 12, Joshua, get up. The problem isn't with me. The problem is with the assembly. He says, therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have devoted, become devoted for destruction. He says, uh, I'm sorry, verse 13, get up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel, You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. So when we think about failure, when we think about defeat, when we think about adversity and opposition in our lives, times of trouble and defeat are times of reconciliation and reformation. We need to sit back and ask ourselves, Are we disconnected from God due to our sin? Is there a reconciliation process that needs to take place because of the sin that we are choosing to indulge in? Amen. Who is our number one enemy? (laughs) Satan himself. There you go. Satan himself. If you find yourself under... uh, experiencing much defeat, if you find yourself unable to overcome your sins, if you find yourself allowing Satan to have dominion in your life, ask yourself, 
Has God withdrawn his presence from me because of the sin that I indulge in? The word Achan, the name Achan, is a play on the Hebrew word amor, which means trouble. So the truth is that the Lord will bring trouble on the troublers. Amen. Realize sin is no secret. What is hidden from men is fully exposed to God. Look at verses 14 and 15. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes, and the tribe that the Lord takes by lot shall come near by clans. And the clan that the Lord takes shall come near by households or families. And the family that the Lord takes shall come near by man. And he who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire. He and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord. And because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel, what is hidden from men is fully exposed to God. Achan's sin was hidden. No one knew what was going on. No one knew why they were being defeated or why they had been defeated by AI. There was no knowledge of Achan's sin among the people. But it was God who exposed the sin of to the assembly. In Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13 it says this. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must give an account. Church, we cannot hide from God. The Bible says that we are naked and fully exposed. Now that word exposed is very interesting in the Greek. That word exposed, it literally means to seize or or to twist the throat, to, to expose the neck. And I'm not sure what that really meant to the readers of the letter of Hebrews. Not sure what that really means. But I can imagine that there is someone who has committed a crime and they are doing all that they can to stay in hiding to prevent themselves from being exposed to the community, to law enforcement, so they don't have to suffer the consequences of their behavior. How often do we try to hide our sin from the assembly? Pretty often. But the reality is, is that God will expose us. And this, the, this word expose is very aggressive. That means that we will have a tendency to resist being exposed. <laughs> but we can't resist God. We can't resist God's exposure. Amen? Neither could Achan. Who we are at Who we are at home can be very different from what we pretend to be around the assembly. Look at verses 21 and 22. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them and took them. And see, they are hidden in the earth inside my house. The Bible says tent, but I'm going to say house. With the silver underneath, so Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and behold, it was hidden in his house with the silver underneath. We can fool the church, but we can't fool our family. It was the hidden sin in the home that brought disaster to the assembly. Dirty little secrets. If we're honest, we all have them. 
as we gather in here this morning, we can put on our church face. We can put on our church clothes. We can put on our church shoes. Our church socks. We can put on our church walk, our church talk, and still be indulging in sin. And if your sin has yet to be exposed, I would encourage you to be very thankful and appreciative of God's mercy. The sin that you are hiding from the church is the very sin that you need to remove from your home. And you know what? That sin may not belong to you. It may belong to someone else in your house. But I believe that God has given us the responsibility of exposing that sin and ridding that sin from our home. Why do you say that, Brother Josh? Because Joshua had the responsibility of ridding that sin from the assembly, even though he himself did not commit that sin. Some of us have some home cleaning to do. Number three, realize that sin is selfishness or self-centeredness. The Bible says that Achan kept what belonged to God. When you go back in Joshua chapter 6 and read verses 17 through 19, it says, And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you keep yourself from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble on it. There's another play on words there. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They belong to him. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 24, verse number 1, a psalm of David, the earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants belong to the Lord. How often do we say things like, that's my car, that's my house, my money, my clothes, my shoes, my food, my job, my family, my kids, my wife, my church. <laughs> Nothing belongs to us. Everything belongs to God. And if we really think about that and we instill that within our mind and create this philosophy that it is God's car, it is God's house, it is God's family, that will change the way that we interact with people. That will change the way we steward the things that God has given us, would it not? Because now, everything that we have will be given the purpose of glorifying God and helping people to see Him. Realization number four. Sin is a Sequence. Look at verse 21. So Achan is exposed. Achan is talking to Joshua. And he gives a reason as to, or he explains what happened, why he sinned against God. Verse 21, he says, When I saw the plunder, a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. He says, I covet it. I took them. And he says, they are 
hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. Let's look at the sequence of sin. Achan says, first, I saw. That word saw in the, in the Hebrew, it literally means the goal of motion. To be goal-oriented to one particular thing. The best way that I can try to describe this is to, to think of a running back running for a touchdown. When he gets that ball, his ambition is to get to that touchdown by any means necessary. Nothing else in the world matters but getting to that touchdown. And he won't let anything stop him from reaching his goal. So Achan is saying, I saw these spoils of Jericho and I could not resist them. And all I thought about was obtaining them for myself and nothing was going to stop me, not even the commandment from God. Not even his consequences to destroy me. That's powerful. Then he says, I coveted. That word in the Hebrew, it means to, to take pleasure in, but it goes a step far, further. It means to, to publicly praise. So Achan is saying, I don't take pleasure in having a relationship with God, not as much pleasure as I take in having these devoted things. And having the spoils of Jericho. And once I get these things, at some point, I am going to publicly praise the things that I have. A serious church. Who does public praise belong to? It belongs to God. What is the theme of your everyday communication? What is that one thing that you always talk about, that thing that you're so passionate about, that thing that you, that you brag on at every opportunity you get? Oh, it should be God. Then Achan says, I took. That translates from the Hebrew. It means to take into marriage. These are some very strong words that Achan is using. He says, not only was I goal-oriented, no, not only did I take pleasure and I wanted to publicly praise it, but I wanted, to, I wanted to become married to these things that were devoted to God. That means I, I'm, I'm committed to these things. I'm in a covenant relationship with these things. It's a serious. Then he says, I hid. We need to be very careful not to be so hard on Achan. Remember, God had said that the children of Israel sinned against God in taking of the uh, devoted, accursed things, but only Achan was the one who committed that sin. Now, this isn't in the scriptures, but this is my personal opinion. I believe that Achan did what the children of Israel wanted to do. I think the children of Israel was stuck at sequence number two, where they also wanted the spoils of Jericho. They just didn't carry out the behavior. So Achan was pretty much showing uh, or behaving in the way that the children of Israel wanted to. And what does that mean for us today? A lot of times we can get so caught up in the sins that we can see. The physical sins. The sins that are very observable by the naked eye. But we tend to ignore the sins of the heart. I believe the children of Israel had a sin in their heart. Where they wanted these things from Jericho. So what does that mean for us? 
that we need not to minimize the invisible sins. The sins of the heart. Bitterness. Resentment. Hatred. Anger. Racism. Unbelief. Fear. Excessive worry. Lust. Apathy. Indifference. These sins of the heart are just as damaging as the physical ones. Realization number five. Realize that sin is solvable. Verse 13. Joshua says, uh, God says to Joshua, go and consecrate the people. Tell them to consecrate themselves for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There are things that are set apart among you, Israel. You will not be able to stand against your enemies until you remove what is set apart. Now, the God of the Old Testament gets a bad rap, right? They say that the God of the Old Testament is ruthless. He's an angry God. I don't see that at all. Let's take another look at this passage. God is telling Joshua to tell the assembly, the children of Israel, to consecrate themselves. In other words, sanctify yourselves. Set yourself apart from these devoted things. And in doing so, I am giving you time to destroy them before I call you and your behavior into account. Do you see that? God here is revealing his grace that he gave Achan a night to confess, to repent, and to rid himself of these accursed things. Grace and mercy. God was providing Achan a, a way of escape. He was giving him the opportunity to repent and to confess, and Achan still stands there and says, it's not me. Do we not get this opportunity with every breath that we take? Do we not get this opportunity every time we assemble here Sunday morning? Verses 19 through 20, we see Achan's confession. So Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and make a confession to him. I urge you, tell me what you have done. Do not hide anything from me. Achan replied to Joshua, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. I find very interesting here that Joshua says, Make a confession to him. And by doing so, you give glory to the Lord. We often associate giving glory to God with public corporate worship. With praying and singing and preaching and testifying about God's greatness and what he's done in our lives. But here Joshua says, we also give glory to God when we confess and admit to God and to ourselves and to other people that we have sinned against God. Church, that's powerful. We say we, we live to glorify God, but very few of us are willing to admit that we sin. Sin is solvable. And we can see that outside of the gate. Look at verse 24 and 25 of chapter 7. It says, Then Joshua and all of Israel took Achan the son of Zerah, the silver, the cloak, and the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his ox, his donkey, and sheep, his tent, and all that he had, and brought them up to the valley of Achor. Now the valley of Achor is, uh, Achor means trouble, so Joshua brought the troubler to this valley of 
trouble to be troubled by God. And they did this because they knew that Achan's death would bring them life, would bring them victory. Israel's sin was solvable by the death of one man, Achan. And many ask, well, why did, his, why did his children have to die? Why did his wife have, why did his family become destroyed? Well, maybe they were accomplices to his sin. Maybe they helped him to hide the accursed things. This is just speculation. But it could be that God was also showing his grace and mercy to the children in the fact that when these children grew up, they would remember the sin of their father. And if you've been living long enough, you will know that oftentimes the children commit the generational sins of the parent. Amen. So maybe God was sparing their life by allowing them to die, for lack of better words, sinless. But of course, that's just speculation. But Achan's death restored the children of Israel in a relationship with God. It removed their sin far from them by the death of one man. We can't talk about Achan without talking about Jesus. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 12, and so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate just as Achan did, to make the people holy through his own blood. Achan is a type of Christ. We know that Achan was not without sin, but he delivered God's people from their sin through his death. But Jesus church is our deliverer knowing that we all have sin in our life we are all troubled by sin and we needed something we needed someone to shed their blood on our behalf so that we can be reconciled to God as well if you're here this morning and your life is full of trouble your life is full of sin and you have yet to Respond to the invitation to the gospel, knowing that Jesus lived, died, and was resurrected. That Jesus, through his blood, his shedding of blood on the cross, has gained us access to the forgiveness of the sins in our life. So that we too can have victory over Satan, our number one enemy. So that our sin does not leave us to cursed by God for destruction. God is showing his grace and mercy towards us every day that he gives us. Every day to repent. Every day to make it right. If you're here this morning and you have not yet responded to the gospel by being obedient to baptism, where it is in the water we come in contact with the blood of Christ and God washes our sins away. Sin is solvable. If you're here in need of anything, won't you let it be known as we all together sing the song of invitation.